You're listening to Romancing in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to the Romancing in Paris podcast. I'm your host, Lily Heisey. In this podcast, we'll be traveling around the city as I pick out my top romantic spots per arrondissement. You don't have to visit these places only as a couple. Exploring them can be the expression of your own love of Paris. Are you ready to get romancing in Paris? Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Romancing in Paris. We're carrying on with our tour of the first circles of the left bank districts, having done the fifth and sixth in the previous two episodes, which now brings us to the seventh. In these last two, we visited an ancient site, then a historic restaurant. So for today's episode, I wanted to change things up a little. Plus, we haven't been back to a museum in a little while. The 7th actually has a few great museums, the most famous being the Musée d'Orsay. However, it isn't necessarily the district's most romantic museum. Instead, the one we're going to visit today is romantic in a number of ways, thanks to its setting, the artist it celebrates, the type of art created, and for some romance. For it was this artist and his lover who make up one of the greatest love stories in art history. Grab your cherie. We're going to the Musée Rodin. The 7th district has a great concentration of historic mansions. Once called the Faubourg Saint-Germain, or the Saint-Germain borough or suburb, and occupying part of what is now both the 6th and 7th arrondissements, as of the second half of the 17th century and throughout the 18th, the area became popular with aristocrats who lined its main streets with elegant mansions. Hidden behind large walls and often with lovely back gardens, many of these mansions were confiscated during the French Revolution. Over the course of the 19th century, some were converted into government ministries and embassies, while others fell into abandonment. That was the condition of the Hotel Biron when Auguste Rodin discovered it in 1908. The regal home on Rue de Varenne, right opposite Les Invalides, was originally built in 1732 by architect Jean Aubert for the financier Abraham Penrec, the Marquis de Maurras. In 1753, it was purchased by Louis-Antoine de Gautron, the Duc de Biron, who gave the mansion its name. The Duke passed away in 1789, childless, luckily for him before the Revolution, so it became the property of his brother, who gave it to his wife, Françoise Pauline de la Rochefoucauld, the Marquise de Sévérac. The poor Marquise didn't fare so well in the Revolution and was sent to the guillotine in 1794. Ouch. Surprisingly, the mansion was not confiscated at that point, but instead ended up going down to her nephew, Armand-Joseph de bethune Sully, who didn't spend much time at the mansion. He gradually fell into decline and was later bought by the Société du Sacré-Cœur de Jésus, nuns, in the 1820s, who used it as a school for girls from aristocratic and bourgeois families. This was its purpose until 1905, when the law separating the church and state ordered it confiscated. It sat empty and derelict until Rodin's discovery of it. The renowned sculptor rented out the ground floor of the building before taking over the whole building in 1911. 
It thus made sense that when the artist bequeathed a great deal of his work to the state in 1916, before passing away in 1917, that this site was chosen as the National Museum in his honour. Beautifully restored today, Rodin's works are both on display throughout the mansion and in its large and enchanting gardens. We'll delve more into this when we visit the venue a little later in the podcast. However, as I mentioned in the introduction, the Rodin Museum isn't only romantic in appearance, it also provides us with an opportunity to talk about his great love story, a very passionate one, which is also evoked in the works of the two artists concerned. Auguste Rodin was born into a middle-class family in Paris in 1840, around the same time as several other famed artists of the second half of the 19th century, like Auguste Renoir and Claude Monet. Possibly due to his undiagnosed poor vision, Rodin didn't do well in school. With a stronger interest in art, at 14, he started studying at l'École Nationale Supérieure des Arts Décoratifs, a decorative arts college. After three failed attempts to get into the Paris Fine Arts Academy, where he would have met Auguste Renoir, Rodin worked as an assistant in a few different sculpture workshops. From 1865 to 1870, he worked for well-known sculptor Aubert Ernest Carrière Belouze, who decorated many prestigious buildings during the Second Empire, such as the Opera Garnier and parts of Napoleon III's addition to the Louvre. In 1875, Renoir made one of his biggest dreams come true, that of doing a grand tour around Italy, a trip during which he was able to see firsthand the works of great master sculptors, namely Michelangelo and Donatello. This left an undeniable effect on the artist, which can be observed in the evolution of his works. In 1877, at age 37, he was back in Paris and getting more commissions. 1880 marked a turning point for the artist, as it was at this time that the French state bought his sculpture, The Age of Bronze, a Michelangelo-esque figure of a man. There are copies of it on display at the Orsay and the Rodin Museums and other venues around the world. To work on this, he was given a studio space at the Dépôt des Marbres, located at 182 Rue de l'Université in the 7th arrondissement, not far from his future space at the Hôtel Biron. In 1882, the wheels of fate led Rodin to fill in for fellow sculptor Alfred Boucher as the professor of a class of young female sculptors. Among them was Camille Claudel. For the next ten years, the tremendously gifted sculptress and Rodin would have an intensely passionate relationship. She was 19 and he 43, but their 24-year age difference wasn't the biggest issue. You see, the same year Camille was born, Auguste had started a relationship with Rose Bure an illiterate seamstress who would stay his companion until his death in 1917, the year he finally married her. Despite this, Camille was Auguste's greatest love, as he was for her, a fervent and tormented love, as we will see. Camille Claudel was born into a rather religious family in the northeast of France in 1864. Later on, her family moved to Nogent-sur-Seine, a town southeast of the capital. Like Rodin, 
Camille showed an early interest in art, and at only 12 years old, her talent was noticed by Alfred Boucher, who was from Nogent, but was living in Paris. He encouraged Camille to pursue her sculpture. Dedicating herself to this as a teenager, she managed to persuade her mother to let her study in Paris. So her mother packed up Camille and her two younger siblings and moved into an apartment on Boulevard Montparnasse. Camille worked at a studio on nearby Rue Notre-Dame-des-Champs, where she was joined by other young female artists. In 1882, she studied under Alfred Boucher, the class which would subsequently be taken over by Rodin. Rodin instantly noticed her talent, but that wasn't all. It was also her beauty and vibrant personality that captivated him. He took her on as a student at his studio on Rue de l'Université. She became his model, muse, friend, and lover. They tried, not so successfully, to hide their affair, and even escaped off to the Loire Valley together, where they stayed at the Chateau de Lislette. Tune in to the next episode to learn more about it. Their intense love was captured in letters exchanged when they were apart, in which Rodin's love of Camille is very clear, like in this excerpt from a letter from 1886. And I can no longer bear it. I cannot spend another day without seeing you. If not, it is an atrocity. It's over. I can no longer work. You're an evil goddess. But still, I love you with fervor. My Camille, rest assured, I have no other women friends. You own my entire soul. Oh la la, Rhoda. Despite being so madly in love with Camille, Rodin did not make good on his promise to marry her, nor make her his exclusive student. So, after ten years, she split up with him, but it wasn't a simple breakup. Despite trying to take distance from him, Camille often went over to spy on Auguste. Her career was having trouble taking off, and some also accused her of copying Rodin. Although it's true that she did learn a lot from Auguste, she also brought him new perspectives. Camille was an incredibly gifted artist in her own right. Her work was original and daring. Rodin even once said that he'd shown Camille where to find gold, but the gold she found was all her own. After their breakup, Camille produced some of her best works like the waltz, Clotho, and her masterpiece, L'Age Mur, for the Age of Maturity, a sculpture which was commissioned by the state, who then cancelled it. Well, today it's at least on display at the Musée d'Orsay, and the sculpture has a little cameo in the story on the museum, which was included in my last book, There's Only One Paris Tales from Our Time. Camille was included in a number of exhibits, including the Salon d'Automne, and at the Gallery Eugène Blot, alongside the established Impressionist artists. Blot helped promote Camille's work and even dedicated a solo exhibit to her. Some successes, yet many challenges. She had the growing impression that Rodin was plotting against her and preventing her career from advancing, and from her getting important commissions. Although it was later shown that he did try to help her behind the scenes, and he even helped her financially. If you're enjoying this episode of Romancing in Paris, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Storytime in Paris, which interviews a writer with links to Paris, who then reads an excerpt of their writing. Romancing in Paris will be right back after a word from our sponsors. 
And now, back to Romancing in Paris. Rodin himself had moved out to the Villa de Brion in the suburb of Meudon, so he was spending less time in Paris. Camille's paranoia only festered and deepened. This started to monopolize her life and thoughts. She even went as far as destroying a number of her works. The mania was consuming her, so much so that when her father died in 1913, her mother had Camille committed to a mental asylum in ville evreux on the outskirts of Paris. Her mother never once came to see Camille, and she was all but abandoned by once her close brother, Paul, who'd gone on to become a poet-writer and diplomat, with postings in far-flung locations around the globe, all too far from Camille. Camille spent the next 30 years locked up in the asylum until her death in 1943 from famine at age 79 which ravaged all the patients in the asylum due to the poor conditions during World War II. Although she had a tragic end, Camille finally began to have more recognition, gradually, especially in the last 40 years or so. There's now a museum dedicated to her in Nogent-sur-Seine, in the home where Camille lived with her parents as a teenager, and where her artistic spark was founded. The museum houses more than 300 works by Claudel, as well as works by Alfred Boucher, her mentor, and other 19th century French sculptors. But you don't have to go all the way to Nogent to see Camille's works. This brings us around to the Rodin Museum, which is right here in Paris. As I mentioned earlier, Rodin had used the Hotel Biron as his studio as of 1911. With the large collection of his sculptors and drawings bequeathed to the state, the works they already possessed, the museum was first opened in 1919, two years after his death. Visitors enter through the large wall which hides the former mansion from the Rue de Varennes and are instantly treated to some of Rodin's works on display in the garden. We'll return here later, as you might like to start by visiting the inside of the mansion turned museum first. After admiring its grand staircase, you can tour through the museum's 18 rooms which trace the artist's evolution through bronze and marble sculptures, clay sketches, and plaster casts. The Age of Bronze, which I mentioned above, is beautifully presented in an elegant rotunda. You'll then be able to view one of the museum's most romantic works and one of Rodin's most famous, The Kiss. Perhaps it's the perfect spot to steal a kiss from your own sherry? You might also enjoy some of Rodin's other sculptures as the artist's fervent passion was concentrated in his sensual figures and the intense embrace of some of his models. Oh la la! Don't leave before spending some time in room 16, which showcases the works of Camille Claudel and the connection between she and Rodin. Leaving the interior of the museum, you can leisurely amble through the gardens, which are dotted with a number of Rodin's most renowned works, like The Thinker, The Gates of Hell, and The Burgers of Calais. Within the garden is a chic cafe, where you can have lunch or tea time, but there are also plenty of intimate benches, where you can take a lover's break to contemplate Auguste and Camille's love, as well as your own. If you would like to carry on your romantic outing in the 7th, you could go see the works of these artists at the Musée d'Orsay, a few blocks away, or drift down to the Seine to stroll along Les Berges' riverside promenade. For a longer excursion, 
you could go out to visit Rodin's workshop in a home at La Villa de Briand in Madone, an outpost of the Rodin Museum, or venture a little further to Camille Claudel's museum in Nogent. Thank you for listening to this latest episode of Romancing in Paris. If you have a minute, it would be fabulous if you could write or review it. If you would like to support the network, please see our Patreon page, which includes a lot of amazing extra content for members. And if you're looking for more great ideas on exploring romantic Paris, see my website, jetemmeneither.com. Until next time, happy romancing in Paris. This episode of Romancing in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.